Et maintenant, je déclare Euro Disney officiellement ouvert. Euro Disneyland, it will have cost the Disney Corporation $4 billion. Disney executives are hoping that within a year of opening, 11 million people will have gone through the gates. This agreement with the Walt Disney Company is um, a very, very uh, interesting uh, contract and affair. I'm sure it will be a great success. Euro Disneyland is dedicated to the young and the young at heart with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration for all the world. On January 15, 1975, the first Space Mountain opened in the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World. The concept for an indoor space-themed roller coaster dated all the way back to the early 1960s, with Walt Disney and Imagineer John Hench discussing a new Tomorrowland attraction to be named Spaceport. After the success of the Matterhorn, Arrow's revolutionary tubular steel coaster, Disney and Hench wanted to utilize the unique ride system. This time, instead of taking guests to the top of the Swiss Alps, the coaster would take guests on a trip through the final frontier. Unfortunately, when Walt Disney died on December 15, 1966, the plans were shelved, as the company was more focused on completing Walt's Florida project. However, after the Magic Kingdom proved to be massively successful upon its debut in 1971, it was clear that an expansion to the park was necessary to meet the strong demand. More specifically, the park needed more e-ticket attractions to appease young thrill-seekers. The first solution to this was to create a hasty and abridged version of Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean, which would open in the Adventureland section of the park in 1973. The next step was a major expansion to Tomorrowland. This included moving the Carousel of Progress from Disneyland into a new Carousel Theater, building a new people mover in the form of the Tomorrowland Transit Authority, and finally realizing Disney and Hench's dream of an indoor coaster themed after spaceflight. Disney approached communications company RCA to sponsor the attraction, and they agreed, providing $10 million of Space Mountain's approximately $20 million construction cost. The show building, built on the other side of the park's train tracks, featured a paper-wide exterior with a conical shape and tall futuristic spires. The coaster featured two separate tracks and a variety of props and special effects. Space Mountain opened at the Magic Kingdom on January 15, 1975, along with the Carousel of Progress. It debuted to much fanfare, with an entire television special leading up to its grand opening. Hi. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm Lucy. Arnez. I'm Lyle. Wagoner. Meet, Meet Tommy. Tommy Toon. We've been invited to Disney World to see Space Mountain. We're traveling light. We brought a smile, a dance, a song. To say Space Mountain was a hit would be an understatement. The ride was so successful that two years later in 1977, Disneyland would receive a Space Mountain of its own. A multitude of size and track accommodations had to be implemented in order to fit the attraction into Disneyland's limited space. But the experience of the two attractions was essentially the same, with Disneyland's different ride cars, lack of two-track system, and smaller size being the main differences. In 1983, six years after Disneyland's Space Mountain would debut, Tokyo Disneyland would open its gates. The Japanese park featured a Space Mountain on its opening day, closely resembling Disneyland's version. Once again, the coaster received a positive response from guests. In fact, Tokyo Disneyland overall was a massive success for Disney and the Oriental Land Company, the company that owns and operates Tokyo Disney Resort. From the outside, it looks a lot like the other two, but there's one startling difference about Japan's Magic Kingdom. Walt Disney World Productions is designing it, even sharing in the profits, but they do not own this one. Oriental Land Company does. 
And they wanted not a Mickey with slanted eyes, but a mouse that roared American. The Oriental Land Company pays Disney to license its properties and contract its Imagineers, a system that has resulted in arguably the best Disney resort. In 1984, the year after Tokyo Disneyland debuted, the Walt Disney Company hired a new CEO. And he had one question. Where to next? At the top of the showbiz headlines, the Premier of France and the President of the Disney Company signed a multi-million dollar deal today to open Euro Disney in France. The agreement comes after two years of negotiations, during which Disney agreed to give the new park a French flavor. Set to open in five years, the world's fourth Disney playground will occupy 4,400 acres of what is now farmland, 20 miles east of Paris. As part of that cultural compromise, Mickey will still be Mickey and Donald will still be Donald. But in Euro Disney, Goofy becomes Dingo and Snow White will be called Blanche Neige. Liz? Just one year after becoming chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company, Michael Eisner announced plans for a Euro Disneyland to be constructed near Paris, France. This seemed like the next obvious step for international expansion. There was only one problem. They forgot to ask France. While the project was built in coordination with the French government and French contractors, clearly the head of public opinion polling at the Walt Disney Company phoned in his report or was fired after reading the results because the citizens of France were very much not on board. Many prominent French commentators expressed distaste for what they saw as a capitalistic invasion of their beautiful countryside, some going as far as to promote burning the resort down and describing it as a cultural Chernobyl. The CEO of the resort, Robert Fitzpatrick, attempted to assuage the situation by explaining that the company didn't come in and say, okay, we're going to put a beret and a baguette on Mickey Mouse. And yet, potential arsons and comparisons to deadly catastrophes turned out to be the least of the resort's worries. The Magic Kingdom as a park uh, predominantly was developed 30 years ago and will be brought to France intact. It will be different in that it will take not only advantage of but have respect for the French culture. We will be getting now to look at various uh, different means of financing all of the different parts of Euro Disneyland and of all resort to the magic of Disney <laughs> and uh, hope that that in the end makes the dream come true. Here are just a few of the issues that Disney experienced before opening. Number one, Disney executives such as Michael Eisner require that solely English be spoken during all developmental meetings, sparking outrage among French citizens. Number two, Disney's cast member guidelines prohibiting jewelry, facial hair, and certain hairstyles not only angered and disgusted the French as a violation of individual liberties, but it turns out that it was also illegal under French law. Euro Disney spokesman Thor Dengelman pointed out that without the rule, the company would not be able to provide the Disney product that people would be expecting. He completely forgot that no one wanted the product to begin with. He went on to say, It would be like going to see a production of Hamlet in which everyone looked different than you expected. Would you ever go again? Number three, in the four years leading up to Euro Disneyland's opening, three theme parks, all with budgets well over $100 million, opened in France. And by Euro Disneyland's opening, two had gone bankrupt and one was in financial ruin. Not a good sign, but Fitzpatrick was quick to comment, my biggest fear is that we will be too successful. Plans were announced for an MGM Studios Europe and a European Epcot before Euro Disneyland even opened. Number four, Operating under this lack of hesitation, Eisner made sure that the Walt Disney Company would own a 49% stake in the Euro Disneyland Resort. And the only reason they didn't own more was because the French government wouldn't allow it. Number 5. At some point, the French government began dropping heavy hints to Eisner and the other executives that perhaps the French would not accept a full-on Disney invasion. Number 6. As construction progressed, protesting increased. On one trip by Eisner to check on the development, he was greeted by demonstrators that were throwing eggs and globs of ketchup and holding Mickey Go Home signs. Number 7. Small villages near the resort expressed concerns over the noise that a nighttime fireworks show would make. Number 8. Disney, sticking with their typical policy, banned wine from the French theme park. And finally, number 9. The name Euro Disneyland did not play well in Europe. As Eisner later stated, As Americans, the word Euro is believed to mean glamorous or exciting. For Europeans, it turned out to be a term that they associated with business, currency, and commerce. All of those issues, and I'm sure others that I did not mention, were all present before opening day. So did Eisner and Disney manage to work out all of the kinks, and did Euro Disneyland turn out to be another smashing success for the company? 
Disney is not known for nailing their opening day events. The opening of Disneyland was disastrous for a variety of reasons, the most cited being the use of counterfeit tickets that more than doubled the expected number of visitors. The opening day of Euro Disneyland, April 12, 1992, had the exact opposite problem. The head of public opinion polling, most likely given one last chance by the company, estimated that around 500,000 visitors could show up on opening day. How many actually showed up? Around 25,000. More people rushed through the gates of Disneyland on the press preview day in 1955 than entered Euro Disneyland on its opening day in 1992. This was for a variety of reasons. First, scared at the potential of half a million guests at a park made for around 60,000, the French government, police, media, and Disney attempted to warn the masses not to all come on opening day. This worked a little too well. Also, employees working for the suburban railroad between Paris and Euro Disneyland went on strike, most likely due to the impossible workload of shuttling the projected amount of visitors to the park. Supposedly, two bombs were detonated on nearby power lines in an attempt to sabotage the park's opening, although this did not cut off electricity. The attendance numbers for opening day were embarrassing, and Eisner and Disney hoped that this was just a one-day anomaly. Perhaps the most depressing part of the entire situation was that the park itself was brilliant. Spearheaded by famed Imagineer Tony Baxter, Europe's Magic Kingdom was a beautiful, classy, and quaint version of its predecessors. Not only did it have intricate theming and groundbreaking storytelling continuity, but the park maintained a surprisingly calm atmosphere, the theme park equivalent to a Sunday stroll. Baxter and his team did their homework, and had it not been for their care and consideration, the outrage the park caused could have been a lot worse. Baxter made the integration of French culture look easy. This could be due to the fact that he had been drawing inspiration from one Frenchman in particular for nearly two decades. Both Walt Disney and Tony Baxter had a mutual appreciation for the work of 19th century French novelist Jules Verne. Verne's novels are among the most recognizable of his era, and his work, along with that of H.G. Wells, popularized the science fiction genre and more specifically, fascination in steampunk technology. Steampunk, as the name implies, is a genre of science fiction that focuses on technology powered by steam, and often features elaborate bronze pipes, cogs, and other metallic structures. Walt Disney would produce feature film adaptions of Verne's novels, the most popular of these being 1954's adaption of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. In 1970, four years after the death of Walt Disney, Tony Baxter would begin his work with Walt Disney Imagineering. One of his first projects was art director on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Submarine Voyage, which was to debut at the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World on opening day. This would only be the first of many times that Baxter would attempt to adapt Jules Verne's work for Disney Parks. During construction on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, Baxter would design the concept for a new land in Disneyland, the never-built Discovery Bay, an area that would have been filled with attractions directly based off of the work of Verne's and Wells. In the late 1980s, Baxter would be given the most control he had been granted yet. He was named the executive producer of Euro Disneyland. With his oversight, Euro Disneyland received the most elaborate Big Thunder Mountain in the world, a breathtaking and unique castle, and the first of any Magic Kingdom-style Disney park to not receive a Tomorrowland. In its place, a new land was constructed, named Discoveryland. Designed by Imagineer Tim Delaney and his team, Discoveryland drew inspiration from Discovery Bay, the work of Vernon Wells, and a variety of other sources. When it opened in 1992, the land looked much different than any Tomorrowland that had come before it, and it actually solved one of the biggest issues that Disney parks have been facing since their inception. The Tomorrowland problem, as has been named by Imagineers and fans, is the issue that arises when Disney constructs or renovates the area, only to have technology catch up to the theming, rendering it obsolete. Put simply, the problem with tomorrow is that it always comes. But with Discoveryland, Delaney and his team solved this issue. They created a tomorrow that will never come, a tomorrow imagined by the creative minds of the past. Right, when Jules Verne was 11 years old, he ran away to sea as a cabin boy bound for the West Indies, but his father caught him in the nick of time and took him home and gave him a good ticking off and quite right too. And from that moment on, Jules Verne made a vow that he would only ever travel in his imagination. And so he did, to the North Pole, to the moon, 20,000 leagues under the sea. And he took the rest of us on the ride with him. And tonight, Jules Verne returns to France to open Discoveryland, which features his favorite destination, the future. Bonsoir. 
le monde de Discoveryland retrace la quête des... pour parvenir à concrétiser les espoirs et les rêves de ces hommes de tous les temps qui furent et sont les inventeurs du futur. Ici, on peut constater qu'imagination rime avec innovation. Aussi, j'ai le plaisir d'ouvrir Discoveryland par ce dicton qui depuis toujours a été le mien. Ce que l'homme peut concevoir, l'homme peut l'accomplir. When Discoveryland opened, it featured an Astro Orbiter style ride named the Orbitron. It also had a Videopolis themed after the island at the top of the world, the film partly responsible for killing the chances of Discovery Bay at Disneyland. Paris's Videopolis was originally supposed to be a teen dance club, similar to its Disneyland counterpart. But this was scrapped due to lack of interest. Instead, when Videopolis opened in 1992, it featured a show called Rock Shock, a stage show featuring dancing teens that were described as following in the footsteps of Jules Verne. Because when I think of Jules Verne, I think of this. Good job. Also located in this area was Café Hyperion, a counter-service restaurant themed to ticket booths for the Dock Dirigible. Finally, Discoveryland featured Le Visionarium, the time-travel-themed Circle Vision animatronic hybrid show in which guests traveled through time with the Timekeeper and even ran into Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. On the border of Discoveryland were a few attractions familiar to fans of the U.S. parks. On opening day, Discoveryland featured a Star Tours and Captain EO, which saw George Lucas' sci-fi vision find a home in Discoveryland. There was also an Autopia in Discoveryland, themed to 1950s Ford cars. Discoveryland is an example of just one of Euro Disneyland's many cases of brilliant theming and execution. This made the park's controversy and troubled opening all the more painful. And worse, the issues would persist. The resort was a disaster. Euro Disneyland's numbers did not improve as expected and the sheer cost of running all of the resort's hotels were making the financial problems even worse. This was due in part to the global recession in the early 90s, on top of the mixed response from the French locals. In its opening year, the park lost around 3,000 of its 12,000 employees due to alleged poor working conditions. In 1994, just two years after its debut, Eisner referenced the possibility that Euro Disneyland might close down completely, and the company began admitting the poor performance and financial issues that the park was facing. But luckily, despite the failure of the resort catching Eisner and everyone else off guard, they had a backup. When looking over the opening day Discoveryland attractions, you might notice that a familiar e-ticket is missing. Imagineers had planned to include said attraction in Discoveryland on opening day, but after going over the budget for the proposed ride, they decided to save it for a few years after opening to reinvigorate interest in the park in case that it waned. They did not expect the situation to be as dire as it was. So with no other options and an increasingly limited budget, Euro Disneyland put all of its hope into the opening of a new Space Mountain. If it was successful, it could potentially save the resort. And if it wasn't, Euro Disneyland would be the first Disney park to become completely defunct. <laughs> 